Let's begin by offering our respects to our founder Acharya, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. ओम अज्ञान तिमिरंदस्य ज्ञानंजना शलाकाय चक्षुर उन्मिलितम येना तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः नम ओम विष्णु पदाय कृष्ण प्रेस्थाय भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामिन इति नामिने नमस्ते सरस्वते देवे गौरवानी प्रचारिने निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देशतारिने हे कृष्ण करुण सिंधु दीन बंधु जगतपते गोपेश गोपिका कांत राधा कांत नमोस्तुते तप्त कंचन गौरंगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी वृषभानु सुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वाच कल्पतरु व्यश्च कृपा सिंधु व्यव पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादी गौरभक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे प्लीज रिपीट आफ्टर मी ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय 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 ओके सो वी वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू आवर वीकली भगवत गीता क्लासेस वी हैव विथ अस हियर आजा दिव्या देवीना दीप्ति अदानी दुर्गा प्रसाद हरमन बक्षानी करुणा जाधवानी मंजू मीना भारवानी एन सी वेंकटचारी नेहा छतलानी देन माय पेरेंट्स आदे देन वी हैव श्री हरि राधा देन वी हैव सुहानी विवांश एंड सैंड्रा ओके सो व्हाट डिड वी सी इन द प्रीवियस क्लास What is the title of chapter eight? The title of chapter eight is Hari Krishna Mata Ji, Dhanavat Pranam, Chapter Eight. Title is Attaining the Supreme. Hari Krishna Mata Ji, Dhanavat. 
Hare Krishna. Thank you. Yes, attaining the supreme. So here Krishna is talking about how we can attain him. Because Arjuna uh, asks this crucial question at the beginning of the chapter as to how we can remember you at the time of death. So in order to attain the Lord, it's crucial that we can remember the Lord at the time of death. The death, the time of death is our final exam. So just as a student has to do well in his final exam, it's important that we in this human body, we can remember the Lord at the time of death because our last thoughts on our mind is what is going to determine our next destination. So if we want to go to the spiritual world, if we want to go to Krishna, then we have to remember the Lord at the time of death. And Bhishma Dev uh, showed us by his own personal example as to how one should give up the body. Because when Bhishma Dev uh, was on that bed of arrows, the war had finished and uh, he wanted to give up his body. At that time, he requested Krishna to please stand uh, in front no? so that he can give up his body by looking at the lotus face of Lord Sri Krishna. So like that, we must uh, remember the Lord. And for that, to, to be able to remember the Lord, we need to be practicing bhakti throughout our lifetime. It's not that we think that, okay, I can enjoy. And then at the time of death, I can remember the Lord. No, that will not happen. Mm -hmm. What comes to our mind at the time of death is that which we are most attached to. Like we saw in the case of Ajamila. He was most attached to his youngest son. So he called out to his youngest son when he saw the Yamadutas. But fortunately, his youngest son's name is also the name of the Supreme Personality of God, Narayan. And therefore, Ajamila was given an extension. He was given some extra period of time to perfect his life. The Vishnu Dutas arrived and then he got some extension. But we may not be so fortunate. We may not get that extension. When it's time to go, we have to go. So therefore, if we practice bhakti to our, throughout our lifetime, and if that is our number one priority, then we will be able to remember the Lord at the time of death. Of course, we also saw this verse wherein in case of uh, bodily disturbances, because we discussed how death is painful. So in, in if for any reason, for bodily disturbances or for any reason, if we are not able to remember the Lord, but we have practiced bhakti to, uh, throughout our lifetime with sincerity and satatam, no, constantly, then the Lord will not forget. Even if we may happen to forget for some reason, the Lord will not forget. Every single thing that we do in our devotional life, the Lord uh, makes a careful note of it. So this entire chapter is dedicated on how we can remember the Lord. The whole chapter is based on that. How many verses Arjuna has spoken so far in this chapter? The chapter began with Arjuna asking, how many questions? 7. Uh, five, 5 and then 6 and then 7. Yeah, so totally in the first two shlokas, Arjuna has asked 7 questions. So these are the only two verses that Arjuna has spoken in this entire chapter. You may recall that the whole of the 7th chapter was spoken by Krishna. Arjuna did not speak a single verse. Then at the end of 7th chapter, Krishna used some technical terms. And therefore, now Arjuna is inquiring the meaning of those technical terms. And that's what is Arjuna's inquiry in the beginning of chapter number 8. But again, throughout the uh, chapter, except for the four, first two shlokas where Arjuna is making that inquiry, Krishna is practically speaking the whole chapter. So again, remember, this is the bhakti section. In seventh chapter, we discussed how the whole thing is just flowing directly from Krishna's heart, the bhakti section. And even chapter 8, practically the whole chapter is spoken by Krishna, except the first two shlokas, where Arjuna is inquiring about those technical terms that Krishna used towards the end of chapter number 7. So, and see, Arjuna asking those, the meaning of those technical terms to Krishna also indicates that Arjuna is a very good student because he is paying close attention to what is it that Krishna is speaking, right? He is uh, very, very attentive to what Krishna is saying. As, as soon as Krishna has used some terms, those technical terms which Arjuna did not understand, immediately he's inquiring from him, what is the meaning of those terms? So it shows a very good teacher and disciple relationship. So Arjuna, we can say he's a very, very attentive and very good student. Okay, so as we discussed throughout the chapter, Krishna is talking about remembrance. And so we saw, uh, first Krishna talk, spoke about uh, remembrance of Krishna at death. 
Then he spoke about remembrance by Yoga Mishra Bhakti. And the previous class, we saw Krishna speaking about remembrance by Shuddha Bhakti. And then in the previous class, we also saw how Krishna is comparing the nature of the material and the spiritual world. So remembrance by comparing the material and the spiritual worlds. Because if we see the contrast between the two worlds, then we will be attracted towards the spiritual world. So therefore, he is contrasting these two uh, material and spiritual worlds. Can you remember some of the characteristics of the spiritual world that we saw in the previous class or some of the characteristics of the material world? that we saw in the previous class. For example, the characteristics of the material world is that the material world is temporary and it's Dukhale Shashvatam. Are you talking in that some, some part? Yes, exactly. So Krishna says that the material world is Dukhalayam Ashashvatam. Dukhalayam means it is a place full of Dukha, place full of miseries. No matter who one may be, one is suffering. Anybody who says that I'm very happy, I have no problems is actually lying. No such person can exist on the planet unless one is a pure devotee. And it doesn't mean that a pure devotee does not have problems. A pure devotee does have problems, but he, he has transcended or he can transcend those problems. So those problems do not affect him like they affect uh, a non-devotee. Okay. So, an Ashashwatam. Ashashwatam means it is temporary. So, whatever is there in this material world is temporary. We saw how all the planets, the 14 planetary systems in the material world, they are all destroyed. At the end of Brahma's day, which planets are destroyed? How many of those 14 planets? Let me share the screen. We saw this also. Here. So we discussed how there are 14 planetary systems within our universe. And at the end of Krishna's lifetime, all are, I'm sorry, at the end of Brahma's lifetime, all of them are uh, destroyed. And at the end of Brahma's day, there is a partial devastation. We saw how the residents of Maharloka go up to Janaloka. And from Maharloka below, all these planetary systems are destroyed at the end of Brahma's day. Maharloka is not destroyed, but it is unfit for habitation because of excess heat. Therefore, the residents shift from Maharloka to Janaloka or the higher planetary systems. Okay, what else did we see about the spiritual world? The spiritual world, we saw that there was a, it was, it's not temporary, first of all, and once been gone there, then you don't have to come back or you don't have to return to this material world. And then, um, and so it's divine. Everybody's doing service there. Yes, exactly. The uh, Once one attains a spiritual world, Krishna says that you don't have to come back again. But material world is not like that. It is a place where there is repeated birth, death, disease and old age. Okay, another important point that we saw was Krishna says that the spiritual world is unmanifest. It, it's uh, one cannot with an ordinary vision, one cannot see the spiritual world. Sometimes people say, no, I cannot see God. So does, therefore God does not exist. But there are so many things that we cannot see. I cannot even see the person who's behind the wall. So that doesn't mean that person does not exist. It's just that my vision is not good enough to be able to see the person on the other side of the wall. So the spiritual world is unmanifest to mundane eyes. Okay. And um, the material world is manifest and unmanifest. So there is repeated uh, creation and destruction of the material world. But the Lord's abode never changes like the material world. <laughs> And it's also the supreme destination and a place of no return, as we already discussed. So today we will be seeing uh, from verse number 22. Here, Krishna is going to talk about how to attain that spiritual world. So long he is talking about the glories of the spiritual world by contrasting it with the material world. Now he is going to say, how can we attain that spiritual world? Okay, but before we begin, I need one volunteer to read, please. 
Can I, can I do? Yes, Aja. Yes, Aja. Thank you. So let's hear the shloka first. Purusha Sapara Partha Bhaktya Labhyasthananyaya Yasyantasthani Bhutani Yena Sarvamidam Tadam Translation The Supreme Personality of God, Godhead, who is greater than all, is attainable by unalloyed devotion. Although He is present in His abode, he is all pervading and everything is situated within him. So how to attain that spiritual world? How to attain the Supreme Personality of God? How? By unalloyed devotion. Pure devotional service. Pure bhakti. Bhakti should not be mixed with desire for anything else. It should not be jnana mishra bhakti, not karma mishra bhakti. No mishra, no mixing. Pure devotional service. So Krishna is saying one can attain that spiritual world. One can attain him by unalloyed devotion. Ananya. See the word ananya in the Sanskrit. Purusha sa paraha. Purusha sa paraha means that person who is the supreme. That purusha who is para the supreme person. So nobody is greater than God. Nobody is equal to God. Everyone is subordinate. Everyone is a servant. Therefore, one must serve the Lord. Okay, then although he is present in his abode, so although the Lord is present in his abode, he is all pervading. So he is present in his abode, but also he is pervading everywhere. Hmm? And everything is situated within him. So he is all pervading and everything is situated within him, which means he is, he is inside everything and everything is inside him. So how is that possible? It's a little bit uh, difficult to understand, no? So one pastime, if we see, when Krishna um, showed the universal form, when he showed the entire cosmic manifestation in the mouth of, uh, in his own mouth, when Mother Yashoda saw it. See, Krishna is within this material world, no? At that time, he was in uh, Vrindavan. And Yashoda is seeing the whole universe within Krishna's mouth. So what? Krishna, he, she is seeing the whole um, cosmic manifestation in his mouth while Krishna himself is also present there on the earthly planet. So Krishna is within everything and everything is present within Krishna. Okay, now we come to the last section and uh, hopefully we will finish the chapter today. Supremacy of pure devotion in attaining Krishna. So again, Krishna is going to talk about uh, remembrance uh, by establishing how Bhakti Yoga is supreme. It's superior to all other yoga systems. That's how he will actually conclude uh, this chapter and this section. Let's hear the verse. Yatra kale tvanavrittim avrittim chaiva yoginaha prayata yantitam kalam Translation, O best of the Bharatas, I shall now explain to you the different times at which, passing away from this world, the yogi does or does not come back. So now he is going to explain auspicious times and inauspicious times. If somebody passes away at a certain auspicious time, then what is his destination? And if somebody passes away at an inauspicious time, a yogi passes away at an inauspicious time, then what is his destination? Hmm? So he's going to explain the different auspicious and inauspicious times. Agnir Jyotiraha Shuklaha Shanmasa Uttarayanam Tatra prayata gachanti brahma brahma vidojana. Translation Those who know the Supreme Brahman attain that Supreme by passing away from the world during the influence of the fairy god in the light at, a, at an auspicious moment of the day, during the fortnight of the waxing moon, or during the six months when the sun travels in the north. So this is an auspicious time for a yogi to give up his body. What is that auspicious time? During the influence of the fiery god in the 
light at an auspicious moment of the day. So daytime. During the fortnight of the waxing moon. And during the six months when the sun travels in the north. So let us see. See, when the sun travels in the north, that period or the day when the sun starts its northern movement is what is celebrated as Makar Sankranti. In, it is known by different names in different parts of India. Makar Sankranti is the more popular name. So the term Uttarayana is derived from Uttara, north. And Ayana means movement. So that means it is the northern movement of the sun. Makar Sankranti marks the beginning of this upward movement. Lord Surya on his dazzling chariot that has thousands of spokes and magnificent wheels and driven by seven horses begins his journey northward. It begins mid-Jan and ends mid-July approximately. This is the daytime of the demigods. So this is what Krishna is referring to here. During the six months when the sun travels in the north. So what is the time when the sun travels in the south? It is called as Dakshinayana. In the six month period when the sun travels towards the south, it begins on Kark Sankranti in mid-July. Dakshinayana marks the period when the gods and goddesses are in their celestial sleep. It is the night time of the demigods. So auspicious time for a yogi to give up his body is during the period when the sun is moving north. And the other factor here, it says, during the fortnight of the waxing moon. Now, what do you mean by waxing moon? So, we know that there are 30 days in a month, in according to the Vedic calendar. So, uh, here we have the new moon, the new moon or what we call as Amavasya. And then the moon starts to increase. And then after 15 days, now it is the full moon. So, this is called as the period of the waxing moon. Then after full moon, then the moon starts to reduce. Right, this is Purnima. From Purnima, the moon starts to reduce, and then again it comes to uh, Amavasya or new moon after another 15 day period. So, this is the period of the waning moon. So, what is auspicious mm -hmm. is if the yogi passes away at the time of the waxing moon. So, this is what Krishna is mentioning here. So, if he goes during the daytime, during the fortnight of the waxing moon, or during the six months when the sun travels north then he can attain the supreme. Then the yogi, the, the jnana yogi, he can attain the supreme Brahman. He can attain the Brahman effulgence. This is what uh, the jnana yogi wants and this is what he attains. So here we have more information. The word ayana means path or going. The six months when the sun moves towards the north are called uttarayana or the northern path and the six months when it moves south are called dakshinayana or the southern path. These are mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. The first day when the sun begins to move north and enter the zodiacal sign of Capricorn is called Makar Sankranti and the first day when the sun begins to move south and enter the sign of Cancer is called Kark Sankranti. Of these two days of the year, one, on one of these two days of the year, one should perform the Shrad ceremony, which, which one does for the ancestors, right? So if you read this uh, particular chapter uh, from the fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter number 21, this chapter is titled The Movements of the Sun. And uh, in YouTube, there is a channel called Bhagavat Cosmology. You can see in this channel, there are many videos where they are explaining uh, such phenomena, very, very interesting. And you can also read this chapter. So you can see how uh, the Bhagavatam actually states that the sun moves. But according to modern science, the sun does not move. But Bhagavatam version is the sun moves north and the sun moves south every six months. षण्मासादक्षिणायनं तत्र चांद्रमसं ज्योतिर् योगी प्राप्य निवर्तते Translation The mystic who passes away from this world during the smoke, the night, the fortnight of the waning moon or the six months when the sun passes to the south reaches the moon planet but again come, comes back. 
So now Krishna is talking about the inauspicious time. And here he is talking about the karma kandis. The karma kandis, they can reach the moon planet. So the mystic who passes away from this world during the smoke, the night, the fortnight of the waning moon, and the sixth month when the sun is going to the south, then that person can reach the moon planet, but again comes back. So we'll let's just read the purport of this very uh, nice purport. One second. See, we'll see 24. First, in the purpose, Srila Prabhupada writes, when fire, light, day, and the fortnight of the moon are mentioned, it is to be understood that over all of them, there are various presiding deities who make arrangements for the passage of the soul. So all these personalities mentioned here, fire, light, day, and fortnight of the moon, they're all different personalities. And they are handing over the yogi from one to the other. Like how, for example, you have this uh, train, the train is moving from one station to another station and every station has its station master that ensures the smooth uh, passage of the train from that particular station. No? So you have the station master in charge of the different stations. So like that, these are different deities who are in charge of the smooth passing of that particular soul. So they are making arrangements for the sm smooth passage of the soul. At the time of death, the mind carries one on the path to a new life. If one leaves the body at the time designated above, either accidentally or by arrangement, it is possible for him to attain the impersonal Brahma Jyotir. Mystics who are advanced in yoga practice can arrange the time and place to leave the body. So if one is, is uh, advanced in the yoga practice, then the mystic yogi, he can time his uh, time, his leaving the body so that his leaving the body is at an auspicious time okay but others who are not so advanced then others have no control and if by accident they leave at an auspicious moment then they will not return to the cycle of birth and death so others who are not so advanced then they have to depend on uh at what time death is going to happen so by accident, if they happen to leave at this auspicious time, then Srila Prabhupada says then, then they will not return to the cycle of birth and death. But otherwise, there is every possibility that they will have to return. However, for the pure devotee in Krishna consciousness, there is no fear of returning. Whether he leaves the body at an auspicious or an inauspicious moment, by accident or by arrangement. Because remember, for a devotee, a devotee is under the uh, direct uh, protection of Krishna. So it doesn't matter whether he goes at an auspicious or inauspicious time because he is a pure devotee, everything is going to be auspicious for him. He does not have to worry about what time he is going to pass away. And the next one also we will see. Here Srila Prabhupada writes, in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Kapila Muli Me Kapila Muni mentions that those who are expert in fruitive activity. So we discuss we discussed how this is for the karma kandis, those who are expert in uh, karma kanda activities, fruitive activities, and sacrificial methods on earth attain to the moon at death. These elevated souls live on the moon for about ten thousand years by demigod calculation. So, um, the karma kandis they can go to the higher planetary systems. They live on the moon for ten thousand years. 10,000 of the demigod years. Now, 10,000 demigod years and 10,000 earthly years, they are different. Now, we will go back to the PPT and we will see that in some time. So, we will keep that on hold. And what do they do there? They enjoy life by drinking somaras. They eventually return to earth. So, one may think that, okay, 10,000 years of the demigods is such a long extended period of time. But the problem is eventually they have to come back to earth, which um, where again one is... Uh, 
in the cycle of birth and death. This means that on the moon, there are higher classes of living beings, though they may not be perceived by the gross senses. So even on the moon planet, there are living entities who are present, but one cannot see them by the gross senses. So if one goes to the moon and says that I was not able to see any of the living entities, they cannot be perceived by the gross senses. Another thing to note here is this term somaras. In the past, somebody was arguing that even the devatas, they are enjoying uh, liquor, wine, whiskey. They are also drinking somaras. So why is it uh, Why is it that we cannot? So first of all, we have to understand that our rules and regulations are different from the rules and regulations of the higher planetary systems. Those who attain the higher planetary systems, they have earned it because of their extraordinary punya karmas. Secondly, this soma ras is not, you cannot compare this soma ras with the ordinary liquor that is, uh, that is found in the, in the liquor shops here. So there is one reference here from the fourth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. See here, Srila Prabhupada explains, in this word, the word soma means nectar. Soma is a kind of beverage made in the heavenly planets from the moon to the kingdoms of the demigods in the various higher planetary systems. By drinking this Soma beverage, the demigods become more powerful mentally and increase their sensual power and bodily strength. The word Hiranmayena Patrena indicates that this Soma beverage is not an ordinary intoxicating liquor. The demigods would not touch any kind of liquor, nor is Soma a kind of drug. It is a different kind of beverage available in the heavenly planets. Soma is far different from the liquors made for demoniac people as explained in the next verse. So see this Soma Ras, it increases their mental power, it increases the sensual power and it increases body strength. But the ordinary liquor that we get here is not doing this for us. It is doing exactly the opposite. It reduces our bodily strength, it reduces the sensual power and it also reduces our mental power. So we cannot compare Somaras with the ordinary intoxicating liquor that we get. If one is going to engage in drinking liquor, then see here is the karmic reaction. If you go to fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter number 26, it is titled A Description of the Hellish Planets. Here uh, you have a description of some, some hellish planetary systems wherein uh, uh, it's described that if you commit this kind of a sin, then this is the kind of punishment that is awaiting in this particular hellish planet. There are several, but few of them have been described by Sukadeva Goswami in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So this you can read at your own risk uh, if you want. But we will see this about the liquor here. Any Brahman or Brahmana's wife who drinks liquor is taken by the agents of Yamaraj to the hell known as Ayya Pana. This hell also awaits any Kshatriya, Vaishya or person under a vow who in illusion drinks Somaras. In Ayapana, the agents of Yamaraj stand on their chests and pour melted hot iron into their mouths. So this is the punishment uh, the Bhagavatam is describing for one who drinks liquor. So this is... So one should not think that, oh, I can also intoxicate myself. I can also drink liquor because the demigods are drinking Somaras. Let's come back to our PowerPoint. Okay. So here is a calculation of the earthly years and the demigods. 12 hours of the demigods is our six months. So 100 years of the demigods is 36,000 earthly years. And 12,000 years of the demigods is 4,320,000 years. So this is the calculation of the Demigod years versus our years. So for 10,000 years, 10,000 demigod years, this Karma Kandi can enjoy in the moon planet. But then eventually he has to come back. That's the point. See here, coming back to the point that the sun moves, contrary to what the modern scientists believe, there is also evidence in the Brahma Samhita 
the sun who is the king of all the planets full of infinite effulgence the image of the good soul is as the eye of this world i adore the primeval lord govinda in pursuance of whose order the sun performs his journey mounting the wheel of time so the sun performs his journey which means the sun is on a journey the sun moves and he is moving in accordance to the uh, instruction of lord govinda govinda of course is a name of krishna and there is an entire chapter in the fifth canto of the shrimad bhagavatam and this i already uh, mentioned the movements of the sun chapter number 51 canto number 5 you can read that also can I, can you identify which temple is this very famous temple in india the sun temple the sun temple yes the sun yeah. temple in konark so if you see this uh, structure that was built it was it was also built by our ancestors where the temple was designed as a gorgeously decorated huge chariot mounted on 24 wheels and pulled by seven mighty horses so our ancestors had information that the sun does move therefore this temple was designed in such a way 24 wheels and pulled by seven mighty horses and also we know that surya dev has a charioteer who is the charioteer of surya dev arun arun yes he is the charioteer of surya dev he is the father of which yeah. famous sanskrit from the ramayan ah uh, arun who gave up his life to save sita from ravan jatayu jatayu yes he is the father of jatayu and sampatti okay let's go to 26 शुक्ल कृष्णे गति हेते जगत शाश्वते मते एक यात्यनावृत्तिं अन्यया वर्तते पुनः ट्रांसलेशन अकॉर्डिंग टू वैदिक ओपिनियन देयर आर टू वेज ऑफ पासिंग अवे पासिंग फ्रॉम दिस वर्ल्ड वन इन लाइट एंड वन इन डार्कनेस व्हेन वन पासेस इन लाइट ही डस नॉट कम बैक बट व्हेन वन पासेस इन डार्कनेस ही रिटर्न्स so basically here krishna is summarizing what he said in the previous two verses passing away in light and passing away in darkness so how does all this information what has all this information got to do with bhakti yoga is a devotee concerned about these things passing away in light or passing away in darkness a pure devotee does not matter to him so why is krishna saying all these things let us see okay before that can one choose the time of leaving so yes an expert yogi can choose if he is not expert in choosing then it depends on accident or destiny this we, we read in the purport but one should also understand that nothing happens by chance there is a reason for everything so one cannot say that something has happened by chance if somebody is suffering or somebody has met with an accident or somebody has met with an untimely death or somebody has a big disease it's not by chance right there is a reason for everything so on one side we are saying if one is not expert in choosing then it depends upon accident or destiny on the other side we are saying that nothing happens by chance so how to reconcile the above two seemingly contradicting statements is it an unfair that one accidentally passes away at an auspicious time and attains a higher abode no so how to reconcile the statements you just have to do karma that is given by the vedas and the shastra and then you can choose to go in a pass out pass out from this world in a way where it is asubsious if not taken that way if not taken the path of that way then bhagavatam says there's only two paths that a, a individual condition soul can take attain uh, from passing out of this body right the two paths is one they can attain through asubsious karma one they can attain through bhakti yoga so which path we have to choose we have to we have a intelligence right so our intelligence needs to be used in in that in the instruction of the spiritual master 
and if we don't have a instruction of the spiritual master then the intelligent has to be used through the karma but it should be done pious activities okay very nice anybody else wants to give another perspective One example of this accidental is again in the story of Ajamila. He didn't have the intention of chanting the name of the Lord, right? His intention was that he is calling out to his son. But because the son's name is Narayan, you no, know, the Vishnu Dutas appeared and he got an extension. So, like that, as a special case, one may accidentally pass away as a special mercy of the Lord. Because remember, the Lord, uh, is above rules and regulations. He can override the rules. He is the one who makes the rules. Okay. So therefore, uh, there can be, um, by some special arrangement, somebody may accidentally pass away uh, at an auspicious time. Now, if one plans to leave his body at an auspicious time, will he attain a higher destination? If one plans to, okay, I'm going to give up my body, commit suicide at an auspicious time. This is the time of the... Waxing moon, this is the time of Uttarayan, daytime. Then will he get a higher destination? No, no. I because Krishna is saying it in the Bhagavad Gita. Then a suicidal, you become Brahma Rakshas or you become ghosts. So no, you cannot because that's not the Vedas does never, Veda and spiritual master never approves that because after initiation, your body belongs to the spiritual master and the service to Krishna. And before initiation, your body uh, is... um is um dedicated to you know either maya or your parents or your family or your work or your karma yeah so the body does not belong to us the body belongs to krishna post initiation or pre initiation the body still belongs to krishna because if it was not for krishna we would have not got the body remember we discussed creation in the previous class so this body is not our property so we do not have the right to bring an end to our life not bring an end to our life not even bring an end to anybody else's life any other living entity even the small tiny ant because we do not have the potency to restore life so we do not have the right to take the life away so committing suicide uh, one becomes a Brahma Rakshas. If one is a Brahmana and he commits suicide, then he becomes a Brahma Rakshas. And if one is a non-Brahmana, then he becomes a ghost and then one has to remain uh, here in his subtle body and one is feeling hungry and thirsty, but he does not have the gross body to fulfill his hunger and thirst. So the suffering is much more, much more greater post-suicide. So just because Krishna is saying this here, it doesn't, one must not misinterpret, one must not misunderstand and get the wrong ideas. Okay, So one must be very careful. Okay, let's go to 27. yogi muhyati kaschana tasmat sarveshu kaleshu yoga yukto bhavarjuna Translation, although the devotees who know these two paths, O Arjuna, they are never bewildered. Therefore, be always fixed in devotion. So a devotee does not have to worry about these two paths, no? whether he is going in the day or night, waxing moon or waning moon during the northern uh, journey of the sun or the southern. A devotee does not have to be concerned about this. Why? <laughs> because he is always fixed in Devotion. Tasmat Sarveshu Kaleshu. See, Sarveshu Kaleshu. In all times, at all kal, at all times, he is Yoga Yukta. He is fixed in devotion. So, therefore, a devotee does not have to worry. So, see, again here, Krishna is contrasting how the passage of the of a pure devotee in contrast to the passage of a, a person who is engaged in mystic yoga, how there is a contrast. A pure devotee does not have to worry about the time of departing. The last verse of the chapter. Vedeshu yajyeshu tapasu chaiva Daneshu yad punya phalam pradishtam Atyeti tat sarvam idam viditva Yogi param sthanam upaiti chadyam Om tat saditi Srimad Bhagavad Gita Supanishadsu 
ब्रह्मविद्यायागशास्त्रे श्रीकृष्णाजुन संवाद अक्षर ब्रह्म योगो नाम अष्टमोध्याय Can I continue? Let's begin by offering our respects to oh, the founder Acharya of Iskon, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupad. The recording has stopped, is it? <laughs> Okay, now, okay. yeah. Translation: A person who accepts the path of devotional service is not. Oh, how do you pronounce that? Bereft. Bereft of the results derived from studying the Vedas, performing sacrifices, undergoing austerities, giving charity, or pursuing philosophical and fruitive activities. Simply by performing devotional service. He attains all these, and at the end, he reaches the supreme eternal abode. See here in this last verse, uh, Krishna is talking about the extraordinary potency, the power of devotional service, the power of bhakti. Very, this is a very bold uh, statement. What is he saying? A person who accepts the path of devotional service is not bereft of the results. derived from so he is not it's not that he is not getting the results he also gets the results that are derived from what things studying the vedas performing sacrifices undergoing austerities giving charity or pursuing philosophical or fruitive activities so one person may be doing a lot of charity somebody else may do a lot of yagyas somebody else may be very um, good at studying the shastra somebody may do a lot of tapasya and some others are pursuing philosophical and fruitive activities so what krishna is saying that one who is on the path of bhakti he by default he automatically gets the results that are derived by doing all these other activities he does not have to separately endeavor to do anything else it is everything is considered to be done if one is on the path of bhakti this is a very very important very very powerful statement then what krishna says simply by performing devotional service he attains all these and at the end he reaches the supreme eternal abode so if one person is on, is on the path of bhakti but he is not engaged in any kind of charitable work it doesn't mean that he is not going to get the benefits of uh, engaging in charitable work he gets the benefit of engaging in charity and all these other things by default everything is considered to be done if one is on the path of bhakti See in maths, uh, we have learned this um, concept of subset and superset. So, if A is a subset of B, then whatever is there in A is automatically there in B. So, like that, B is the superset of this subset of studying the Vedas, performing yagyas, and doing in tapasya, charity, pursuing philosophical and fruitive activities. In other words, bhakti yoga is the superset within which. All other yoga systems, karma yoga, jnana yoga, dhyana yoga, are automatically there. So, a bhakti yogi, it's not that he does not get the benefits of doing what a karma yogi does, jnana yogi does, or a dhyana yogi does. He gets all this and he gets more. What Krishna is saying, he does all that, and plus he gets more. He attains all these, and plus what is the extra thing that he is getting? At the end, he reaches a supreme eternal abode. He can attain Goloka. He can attain Vaikuntha. so when when uh, of course when krishna uh, is making such uh, statements he also has to substantiate um, giving the reasons why and how so in this chapter all itself he has explained uh, given two comparisons to explain how this is possible how he by contrasting how a uh, 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 mystic yogi has to 
uh, be worried about the he has to depend on leaving the body at an auspicious time either by arrangement or by accident but for a bhakti yogi that is not required and he also spoke about how uh, bhakti yoga is very easy to perform in contrast to uh, what a yoga mishra bhakta does so that comparison he has given so he has already substantiated in this chapter two reasons as to why a bhakti yogi automatically gets the benefit of everything else that is done and in chapter number nine, he is going to give more reasons to substantiate this particular statement of his. So here is an overview of the chapter. Arjuna's seven questions and Krishna's answers to Arjuna's first six questions are in the um, verses three and four. So one and two are the questions, while three and four are Krishna's answers to Arjuna's first six questions. And the seventh question is what Krishna is answering throughout the chapter. 5 and 8, remembrance of Krishna at death, answer to 7th question. Then remembrance by Yoga Mishra Bhakti. Then he talk, uh, spoke about remembrance by Shuddha Bhakti. And then he spoke about remembrance by comparing the natures of the material and spiritual worlds. So that we are attracted from the material world when we think that material world is a place of enjoyment for us. But when we understand that material world is not a place of enjoyment, then we turn towards spiritual world. So if we are thinking that, oh, this place is great, so nice. I have very good friends. I have very nice social life. I have good children. I have a good wife. I have good parents. I have a good husband. But still it is Dukhalayam Ashashvatam. So when we understand that the material world is not a place for enjoyment, but enjoyment in the spiritual world is Satchit Ananda. It is eternal and it is um, ever-increasing bliss then we will turn our uh, attention and work towards attaining the spiritual realm. And finally, in the last section, which we saw today, remembrance by Bhakti Yoga is easier than by Ashtanga Yoga. Uh, we don't have to worry about um, giving up the body at, a, at an auspicious or inauspicious time. So here you can, you can read this uh, verse by verse summary when I share the slides in the class. And then we see that there are four comparisons Krishna makes in chapter number eight. What are the four comparisons? Result of remembering Krishna versus remembering anything or anyone else at the time of death. This Krishna very specifically uh, mentions. No, So we, we spoke about how uh, destination is not the same. Although death occurs for the devotee and for the non-devotee, the destination is not the same for both. So one should not think everybody anyway has to die. So better to enjoy and die. No. It's different for a devotee and different for a non-devotee. What's the other comparison? What do bhakti yogis do as a matter of practice to remember Krishna at the time of death? So we discussed about how he raises the consciousness and in the chakras, from the lower chakras to the low, higher chakras. Versus what do yoga... I'm sorry, uh, bhakti yogis, uh, we discussed about how Krishna... One remembers Krishna. One has to be constant, pure, and uh, without disturbance, no? without any distractions versus what do yoga mishra bhaktas do to practice the same which is raising the consciousness from the lower to the higher chakras then another comparison we saw the spiritual realm versus the material realm and finally contrasting the safety certainty and directness of one's path post death to the spiritual kingdom of a bhakti yogi versus other yoga systems so four comparisons in this chapter so with this by the mercy of guru guru and krishna we come to the end of chapter number Eight. Shila Prabhupada ki jai, Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai. Do we have any questions? Can I ask you a question? Yes. A Prabhupada says uh, to read his books and to understand and to engage in devotional service by um, association and everything. But if a person is so dull and they're chanting Hare Krishna, can that only be done? to attain Krishna or the other processes that are uh, recommended by Prabhupada and devotees that needs to be done as well. Okay, see, there are 64 items of devotional service, which Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu mentions. There are 64 items of devotional service. So when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu mentions these 64 items, at the end, he picks his top five. What are those top five? He says, first of all, he says Sadhu Sangha. Then he says Nama Kirtan. Then there is Bhagavat Shravan. Then there is Mathura Vas. And fifth, he says, Shraddhaya Murtira Sevaya. So if you see, the first item he mentions is Sadhu Sangha. 
Second item is Nama Kirtan. Sadhu Sangha means devotee association. Secondly, he says chanting the holy name. Uh, Sadhu Sangha Nama Kirtan. Then he says Bhagavad Shravan to hear about the Lord and the devotees of the Lord. Mathura was to reside in a holy place. Now one may be, you are in the US, I am in Chile. So, so we are we are not able to live in Vrindavan Dham. We are not able to live in Mathura Dham or Jagannath Puri or Mayapur. But uh, we can make where we are residing, that place we can make as a holy place by our spiritual practices. Hmm? Then finally, he says, uh, Shraddhaya Murtira Sevaya, to worship the deity with faith. So if you see, before even Nama Kirtan, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, devotee association, Sadhu Sangha. So Sadhu Sangha is very important. If there is no Sadhu Sangha, then even the chanting and everything else, it's only a period of time that everything else will collapse. From Sadhu Sangha, from devotee association, automatically, if you are in devotee association, you will chant and you will do everything else. But if there is no devotee association, over a period of time, there is a great danger and there is a great possibility that it will all collapse. So we must always remain in the association of devotees. What I want to know is if you cannot remain in the association of devotee physically, can verbally it be done by lectures, hearing? Yes, if you are in a situation where you cannot have physical association because maybe you are in an isolated place or whatever, you can get association by hearing online classes, YouTube, so many other ways are there. But whenever there is an opportunity opportunity to have um, association, physical association, then you take the opportunity and you take the opportunity. Don't let it go. But if it's, see, if you can't do the best, then you do the next best. What else can Thank you do? Thank you, Mataji. Very nicely explained. Hare Krishna, Randavad, Pranam, Jashila, Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Yes. We were discussing about the uh, number of years in uh, for the yogis uh, in uh, in in mode, right? Comparing with the way the, we were comparing to. Uh, Yes, in in uh, moon and uh, earth, right? Yes. So and we for so they we said it's ten thousand years they will live there, right? Yes. Uh, Vedic years, okay. Then, Demigod years. Uh, sorry. Demigod years. Demigod years. So can we compare that to Brahma's Brahma's? So does do they come back only after when the next life starts? Oh. No, they come back after they finish 10,000 years. Yeah, 10, so they got years. Brahma's is much greater than that. Okay. 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 So demigod years and earthly years is a different uh, calculation and Lord Brahma's years and earthly years is a different calculation. Okay. Brahma's is much greater than that of... Uh, if I want to compare that, uh, I just have to take all the materials that you have and just do it. Where can where is it available? Just so you'll have to compare. Say so you'll have to compare today's slides with the slides of the previous class. In the previous class we discussed Brahma's years, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One hundred Brahma's years is three hundred and eleven trillion and forty billion years. Okay, so then the life start again, right? After you said all the when when Brahma's life is over, uh, all the planet four fourteen planetary system will. Uh, disappear then again it starts yes so i okay i want to compare that and the moon yeah moon uh, these yogis in the moon <laughs> yeah let me let me see if i have it here on my yeah see 100 years of demigods is earthly years thirty six thousand years but 100 years of Lord Brahma is 311 trillion and 40 billion years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. What else? Okay, then, since there are no more questions, we'll end today's session. Uh, in the next uh, class, if Krishna so sanctions, we will start chapter number nine titled the most confidential knowledge again this chapter begins without arjuna asking any question 
And so it's directly flowing from Krishna's heart. But yes, then Arjuna, in the middle of the chapter, he starts to speak and he reveals his um, realizations. And then he asks some question, which Krishna will answer. So chapter 9 is going to take some time, although it has less uh, shlokas, comparatively a uh, shorter chapter, but it is going to take more time to uh, finish. Anyway, there is no rush. Uh, quality is more important. So I hope that we can finish the course successfully by Krishna's mercy. Till then, have a safe week and uh, happy week in Krishna consciousness. Vancha kalpa taru vyascha, kripa sindhu vyayivacha, patitana pavane bhyo, vaishnave bhyo, namo namaha. Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Srimad Bhagavad Gita ki jai. 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 Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.